So uh, I'm Freya Streller. I'm Natasha Case. And we We're are millennial, millennial entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> that sounds a little ridiculous, but uh, when we started our first company, Cool House, back in 2009, we didn't know shit. Uh, excuse my language, but we were 26 and 25 respectively, had zero experience in the food industry. The recession was looming upon us, and I personally was in the middle of what they call a quarter-life crisis, right? So along our entrepreneurial journey, uh, we started to notice that we were encountering fewer and fewer female executives. From investors courting us, to manufacturers, to retailers, we would interact with women, but the owners of these businesses were all men. In fact, we're never assumed to be the owner of our business. Um, men and women alike ask us to speak to the business owner. In fact, I'm guilty of it too. Uh, recently, a 25-year-old woman approached us who just started this awesome seafood shack, and I asked her to speak to the owner. So, kind of embarrassing. So it seems like we're at a tipping point and times are changing, but are they really? We wanted to explore what the recent data would tell us and share with you our theory of how we think we can change the ratio at the top. We don't think it's as simple as just leaning in, so we're gonna share with you now what we discovered. So in doing this research, we actually found a lot of conflicting data that left us kind of confused. Um, so first we have this 2014 Gallup poll that shows that men, women, and even millennials all still prefer male bosses over female bosses. In the 60 years that Gallup has done this survey, women have never preferred a female boss over a male boss. Even more men have less of a preference between a male and female boss more than women do. Thankfully, workers who have a female boss currently are more likely in the future to prefer a female boss. So this could have a huge impact, obviously. Uh, the more that women are promoted in management positions, the preference for female bosses should continue to rise. Fortune magazine reported last year that female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were at a historic high a historic high that meant only 4.8% of that elite group being women, okay? <laughs> and actually, speaking of the, you know, the psyche of being a female boss, uh, a recent study in the Health and Social Journal found that uh, women who have the job authority to fire, hire, and influence pay show greater signs and more signs of depression than women without this job authority. Conversely, men with this authority have less signs of depression than men without this power. <laughs> um, and we encountered a whole lot of stereotypes, many of which are proliferated by the media and entertainment. For example, women are micromanagers who don't think big enough, but we're great multitaskers and we're born marketers. Also, women are soft and not aggressive enough, but when we exhibit traditional male traits, we're seen as bossy bitches. Uh, men, on the other hand, are bold, fearless leaders with vision. They're not good multitaskers and they're disorganized. Maybe why, that's why all those madmen need their secretaries. Um, but when they exhibit traditionally female traits, they're seen as evolved. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, girl. So, on the flip side of all this, and, and speaking of men, uh, Jack Meyer, the author of The Future of, Me of Men, presents some data on the changing role of men in society, and even concludes that the age of the dominant male is over. So for example, uh, back in 1970, um, average household income earned by women uh, only constituted 4%, right? Today, that's 40% of average household income is earned by women. Women now comprise 60% of all graduating college students, and that, that, that number is even higher for graduate students. And if you were to look at business school as an interesting microcosm of these macro trends, and looked at Harvard Business School's percentage of women entering each class from 1962, which is the first year they admitted women, to today, 2015, where 41% of the women uh, are entering the class, we'd all be buying that stock. Clearly. So it seems like we're poised for an ideal moment for change, uh, especially with technology and the internet. It's more uh, 
at our disposal to amplify a message and have it hurt. Um, as millennials, we were one of the first generations to grow up with moms who had careers, who climbed the corporate ladder, but also helped manage a home and kids. We even have two women running for president. <coughs> Hillary. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> uh, speaking of our moms, we love our moms, uh, there's my mom right there with the mayor. Um, she is a director at the LADWP and works at the mayor's office right now helping craft their sustainability plan. She's on the board of the directors of the Sierra Club. And there's Natasha's mom. Um, she started an animation studio uh, and has worked for Disney for the last 20 years as a timing director and has been nominated for several Emmys. So we have some good, strong female examples. Dad's not too bad either. Yeah. <laughs> um, a different Gallup poll actually tells us that teams managed by female managers are more engaged, meaning more productive, than teams managed by male managers. So what's the implication here? We should be hiring and promoting more female managers. Makes sense, yeah, the, the data, you know, that doesn't lie. And speaking of female entrepreneurship, 30% of all small businesses in the US are women-owned now. That's 9.4 million women-owned businesses generating $1.5 trillion in revenue, employing 7.9 million people. In fact, women-owned businesses are growing at one and a half times the rate of the national average. But something weird's going on here. Women-owned businesses only earn or generate $155,000 a year in revenue versus $630,000 for male-owned businesses and $420,000 uh, overall on average. So clearly we have a ways to go, um, but in doing all this research, everything's sort of trending in the right direction, right? So our view, cautiously optimistic. But you know, back to this, this uh, call to action, how do we change the ratio and do it in an accelerated way? Our theory, build your own house. <laughs> so what do we mean by this? We were actually inspired by a school of feminism which is about constructing your own cultural and social norms instead of infiltrating existing ones. We thought a lot about access to capital, joining the boys club, should we be making deals on the golf course? We're actually pretty good at golf. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> <laughs> we say, change the game. As women of the 21st century, this is our duty. We owe it to ourselves to get comfortable taking risks, putting ourselves out there, and putting our brilliant business ideas out there as well. And we're not just making a case for female entrepreneurship, but doing it in your own authentic way. So clearly, if there are more female-owned and run businesses, we can quickly change the ratio. And all of these studies are saying we need more female boss examples, so let's give it to them. Let's go out there and build our own houses. We like houses, yeah. Um, so we want to share with you a little bit about our entrepreneurial journey, how we went from a beat-up postal van that we bought on Craigslist for $2,900 converted it to an ice cream truck, and kind of scammed AAA, we'll call it bootstrapping, to tow it to the desert for our first ever event, Coachella Music Festival. <laughs> Business term. Um, we went from that, and now we have 10 trucks in four cities, two scoop shops, distribution in 4,000 grocery stores nationwide and growing, 70 employees. Um, and the, we want to share with you the unique value system that we created to help break through these barriers. First point in the value system. We are okay with figuring it out as we go along. Uh, we mentioned we had no experience in the food industry. We were pretty green and naive. We say, use that naivete to your advantage. As was said, at Cool House we love to say, you can walk through a wall when you don't know it's there. We are not afraid to be ourselves. <laughs> so we knew we were doing something unique and disruptive, and uh, we all know authenticity is key to building your brand and business these days. So um, actually, Whole Foods, one of the first retailers to give us a shot on retail shelves, recently admitted that they did not believe our $5 architecturally inspired crazy ice cream sandwiches would sell very well at their stores. Uh, in fact, there's one right there. That's our Louis Bacon ice cream sandwich named after <laughs> Louis Kahn, the architect. It's a brown butter candied bacon ice cream sandwich between chocolate chip cookies. You will probably get one at, after lunch today. 
But, you know, I think we're the only architecturally inspired ice cream company there ever has been and ever will be. And that's been a huge advantage in standing out in the increasingly competitive ice cream space. We knew pretty early on that we wanted to work on the business, not just in the business. And we had an exit in mind. Um, we knew in order to do this, we had to scale and remove ourselves from the day-to-day -day so that we could focus on what we were good at. So we raised money from investors, we launched in strategic cities, we diversified our revenue streams from just the trucks to also the, the scoop shops and the distribution nationwide, as we mentioned. We put organizational systems in place, operational systems, and we grew our team with an org structure that we created. Basically, we took what we learned and liked from corporate structure and put a unique twist on it. And speaking of building our team, we focused heavily on creating company culture and community because what we were doing was kind of revolutionary. Um, we were at the forefront of both the gourmet food truck and artisanal ice cream movement. Um, we, so in that respect, we treat our team members like business partners, actually, with transparency and the goal to train, empower, and reward them when we succeed. So with talent in place and a vision and roadmap in front of us, we allowed ourselves to let go and get out of the way. We raised smart money from strategic investors. We knew it was better to have a smaller piece of a much bigger pie, or should we say ice cream Sammy, than a bigger uh, piece of a much smaller ice cream Sammy. So speaking of pitching investors, we think we have something to learn here from our male counterparts, actually. So we have this really funny theory that men treat business the way that they treat dating. So they get told no a lot, and they're not afraid of it. Um, they know it's sort of a numbers game, right? Get through the no's to get to the yeses, and they don't take it very personally. Um, as women, we're not put in these pitch positions as often as men are. Uh, you know, as women, we're conditioned to be polite and not really ask for what we want. I say we need to put ourselves in these pitch positions as often as possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So another thing is we never, ever, speaking of rejection, um, we're not afraid, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we're not afraid to, you know, we're not afraid of um, ever giving up or failing. Uh, we know it's okay to, you know, uh, things come up and it's, it's part of the challenge of, of growing your business. We don't play the victim and we do not give up easily. So we've had our fair share of failures. We, our, our Miami operation, we shut down. Uh, we've been dropped by retailers. We've been betrayed by key employees that we've trusted. We know that these failures have to be taken in stride, especially as female business owners. It's important that we flex our muscles and just continue on. It's really easy to feel like your self-worth is totally caught up in your business, but it's important to remember that it's just business. And finally, we're not afraid to think big. So when I talk to venture capital and private equity investors and ask them, why is it that women entrepreneurs raise less money than their male counterparts? You know what they tell me? Women don't think big enough. How infuriating <laughs> is that? So, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're entitled to think big. When Bobby Margolis, our first major angel investor, asked us um, what was the ultimate goal with Cool House, we, I told him, we want to be the Ben and Jerry's of our generation, but do it better. He cut a million dollar check two weeks later. So, as you can see... <laughs> <laughs> So as you can see, we've built our own house, just like the women of this series have here today as well. Um, I'm not sure if some of you have seen this, but this is a really funny Tumblr we encountered called Congrats, You Have an All-Male Panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats to us, because clearly we're changing the ratio. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Great.